we are here in Cortona with uh, um, Stuart Kaufman. That is a biologist, a biochemistry, I think. Well, biologist. Yeah, uh, biologist of the Santa Fe Institute. And, and University of Calgary. And University of Calgary, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are here for putting some question about uh, science and spirituality. In, in this Congress, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, science and spirituality, saying that spirituality seems uh, silly and impolite uh, when you, we talk with uh, adult people and well-educated people. It seems not, uh, not polite to talk about spirituality. It seems something like uh, ancient times and uh, so on, for stupid people, as you talk. Uh, but uh, mm, science uh, deals with what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, spirituality deals with values. Right. Uh, how can we deal only what on what it is without any values? Why? Why you think? Uh, how you think they can be put it together? Well, so my entire talk, f I've given three talks here, yeah. Roberto, and they all add up to this morning's talk. So the standard view, which I am challenging is that science, reductionist science, hopes that there is a theory of everything down there at the fundamental basis of physics mm -hmm. that entails everything that happens in the universe and that everything that happens is describable by law, by natural laws. I think that... that the final theory. Yeah, the final theory yes. will entail everything. Yes. Now, Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. the famous cosmologist, has just written an article uh, entitled Gödel and the End of Physics. Gödel being a logician mm. who proved that mathematical axiom systems um, can have statements that, that are true but can't be derived from the axioms. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, what I've done is published a recent book, Reinventing the Sacred, mm. uh, Basic Books, 2008, New York, mm. um, that argues that, that biological evolution uh, particularly by these things called Darwinian pre-adaptations, cannot be pre-stated. We, we have no idea at all ahead of time what the possibilities are. This is truly radical. It's not, not only that we do not know what will happen, we don't even know what can happen. Now, when that's true, it turns out that we cannot make probability statements because we don't know what the space of possibilities are. Furthermore, it turns out that we cannot have a law about the emergence of a Darwinian pre-adaptation. For example, swim bladders, which, which arose from the lungs of lungfish uh, and became filled with water or partially filled with water and then evolved into an organ that adjusts neutral buoyancy in the water column rather than functioning as a limb. So that's a, I mean, as a lung. That's a typical example of a Darwinian pre-adaptation. Mm -hmm. So I asked three questions about this. Uh, did a new function come to exist in the biosphere? Sure neutral buoyancy in the water column. Did it change the evolution of the biosphere? Yeah, sure. New species, new proteins, and so on. Then the critical question is this. Could you say ahead of time all possible Darwinian pre-adaptations just for humans? Where again, a pre-adaptation is a causal property of an organ of no selective use in one environment that may be of selective use in some others. Mm -hmm. So the swim bladder case. As far as I can see, we haven't the faintest idea how to state what the possible Darwinian pre-adaptations are. And the implications of this, if it's right, are huge, yes. because it means there is no sufficient natural law for the evolution of the biosphere. And if that's right, it means that the becoming of the universe, at least for the biosphere and human culture and uh, the human economy and so on, if not the abiotic universe, is not completely describable by natural law. And if so, the dream of Descartes and Galileo and Newton and Einstein and Bohr and Steven Weinberg is false. So this is really a big issue if it's true. Now, what that le leads to is an opening where in place of law, there's a radical creativity in the becoming of the biosphere mm -hmm. so that when the swim bladder arises, um, we can't make probability statements about it, yet it's not random, it's selected. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a non-random, partially lawless, self-consistent, 
co-creation of the biosphere. And we don't have those ideas anywhere in physics, but it's happening in our daily lives and it's happening in the biosphere. So it really changes science. It's like the codependent origination it's exactly, of Buddhist thinking. It's exactly the codependent origination of Buddhist thinking. So this means a radical change in science. Now, this bears on spirituality, because there are two features of contemporary en enlightenment thinking that are the tension between the secular humanist world and spirituality. One is reductionism, where everything that happens is entailed by the theory of everything that we're supposed to find. Yeah. If so, then what's the point of spirituality? Everything's a deductive consequence of that final theory. So there's no point for spirituality. Mm. And the other is what's called the naturalistic fallacy, due to David Hume, mm. uh, who says you cannot deduce ought from is. From the fact that mothers love their children, you cannot deduce that they ought to. Mm. But Hume forgot about agency. You see, in physics there are only happenings. Balls roll down hills. Mm -hmm. But you and I are sitting here talking to one another. Mm -hmm. We're doing something. Doing is not a word that is present in physics. Mm -hmm. But we're agents. Okay? We, we're, we can act on our own behalf in an environment. Mm -hmm. I happen to think an agent is a reproducing system, a molecular reproducing system, that can do a thermodynamic work cycle. Mm -hmm. Whether my definition is right or not, Agency has arisen in the evolution of the universe. We're, we're examples. So are, so are bacteria. But watch. Once there's agency, there's doing. A bacterium swimming up a glucose gradient to get mm -hmm. food. Once there's doing, there's value. It's either food or poison. Once there's value, there's ought. Ought I go get the food, and am I doing it the right way? Okay? Okay, but uh, if you say that uh, from doing emerges a value, it's a functional value, it's not sure. a, a spiritual value. Uh, yeah, not yet. I when see. a bacterium is just a functional value. But uh, if we can't get values, if we can't get values, we can't get spiritual values. Okay. Ah. Once you have in your vocabulary the idea that the becoming of the biosphere and up, if not the whole universe, is partially beyond natural law and profoundly creative, and you have the idea that agency is completely legitimate, therefore values are legitimate, the way is open to say that, in fact, um, the world of spirituality and the world of science can now unite. Stephen Jay Gould is famous for saying that there are two magisteria, religion and science. Mm -hmm. What I'm arguing is, is that Steve Gould, who's a friend of mine and, and died, unfortunately, Steve was wrong. There's one magisterium that has room for science and spirituality and art and plumbing and making video productions and all of human life. Yes, yes. This is very interesting. But um, when we arrive to the idea of God, for example, uh, can we think of this idea like a, a device, a probe, or something useful just to to dig and to find something more about values and about meaning of the universe? Or it is something you you believe uh, has some consistency, as you mentioned, the, the, the idea of God? Well, I, I, I choose to use the word God in a book entitled Reinventing the Sacred. I do not believe in a supernatural God. Billions of people do. Three billion people believe in the Abrahamic God, more or less. Mm -hmm. believe in the Abrahamic God. Um, about a billion of us are secular humanists and don't, but w we secular humanists have become completely um, devoid of spirituality. As I said, we've been told that it's foolish. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a, a value system that is completely commoditized. Mm -hmm. And we, we can see the, the harm that it's causing right now in the economic crisis we're living through. So, so I, think that, I think that God is an invented human symbol. I think it's our most powerful invented human symbol. And I want to use it to mean the natural, natural creativity in the universe. Um, I, I should mention my colleague Gordon Kaufman at Harvard Divinity School where I taught this spring. Gordon has been writing about this for some 15, 20 years. But, but, but he, I had the science that underscores Gordon's theology mm -hmm. and came to the same position that he did 
independently, and now we're, we're, we're working together. So, so the idea is, is to use God as, as this potent symbol in which we are invited to a sense of membership in all of life and the planet. We really are the children of this creativity, um, and we're not made in the image of, of this God. This God is not an agent. Give up the idea of the creator God, say mm -hmm. I, and keep the creativity, which, w I mean, how much more do we want? I mean, everything around us came mm -hmm. into existence, and all that's happened for four billion years is that the sun's been shining, and there's a few chemicals around, and look at the trees around you, and the animals, and the, and and human beings, and, and the walls in front of us that, that we've constructed. All of this is the consequence of the creativity we're talking about. Yeah, but uh, this God has been uh, named like God of the future, God of the becoming, the, the God of the, of the potentiality, not of the God of, of the past, not it the is God a, of the explanation of the of it's the ground a, and so on. It's, 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 it's a, it is taking the notion of creativity, yeah. and uh, by the way, I learned from Wei Ming Tu, who's here and teaches at Harvard, that this is a deeply Confucian idea. Mm. The Confucians have believed for years that the central idea of heaven is creativity. So Wei Ming and I are going to work together in, in, in Beijing, uh, uh, trying to create a notion of of humanism that goes beyond the human enlightenment. There's another point that's terribly important here. If we do not know what can happen mm -hmm. in, say, the biosphere or in our economy, then reason, the highest human virtue of our beloved enlightenment, is an insufficient guide for living your life, yeah. which is frightening when you first think about it. Wow. But that implies that we have to use our whole humanity, reason, emotion, intuition, imagination, metaphor. We have to use everything we've evolved with to manage to live. And this once again calls for, I think, a new enlightenment. We have to put together our whole humanity in a way we've never done in any tradition. Mm -hmm. um, as a global civilization emerges, which I hope will be forever pluralistic and in the new cultural forms as our different civilizations co-evolve together. So as, as Wei Ming Tu said today, we need to remain rooted in our own traditions, whether they be Chinese or European or American or Russian or whatever, yet develop a language to talk to one another without destroying our traditions. Yeah. So, so we have huge tasks in front of us as some kind of, I hope, organic and diverse global civilization emerges. I see. That's the uh, last, uh, last uh, answer, uh, last question about uh, uh, the way you ended the, your speech. That was very impressive for me. You were mm, talking about uh, to walk humble with your God, and I felt something like a, a, a okay, great openness, of course, but also something very humble, really, a, a surrounding uh, feature of your uh, of, of your feeling. Uh, if you can uh, explain better what you mean to be humble and to walk with God. Well, let me give you the saying. It's due to the, uh, the Jewish prophet Micah, about 800 years before Christ, mm. who, said, who said, if I get it right, it has been told you, O mortal, what is required. Mm. Only to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's Micah, that's not me. Yeah. But if you do not have a creator agent God, just creativity as God, then there's nobody there to tell us. It's we talking to ourselves. Yeah. So I, I restate Micah something as, um, we know what is, what is good. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. For that God is the creativity that generated us and the biosphere. And if you think of the membership that you have in this biosphere, mm -hmm. with all of life and the planet, if you're not awed and incapable of a sense of reverence for it, then you're incapable of spirituality. So, um, 
this becoming, this creative becoming of the biosphere and, and our biohistorical beings as humans is, is, is so staggeringly awesome, so worthy of respect. Roughly speaking, what more could one want of a god? But that means walk humbly with all of creation. Yes, yes. Okay? Thank you a lot from the heart. Okay. <laughs>